Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you very much for joining our uh, broadband forum and wireless one and convergence knowledge based webinar. Um, we will start in around about 30 seconds. We'll just let uh, a number of people join so that we have a, a quorum um, and then we'll start very shortly. Bear with us. Okay, so um, with much of a due, let's start. Um, thank you once again for joining our Wireless Wireline Convergence webinar uh, on the topic of bringing new 5G services inside the home with 5G residential gateways. Um, this is the second actually in, in, our, in our series of WWC knowledge based webinars. Um, and we will be generating links for you if you missed the first one uh, on the whole Wireless Wireline Convergence topic. Um, but, uh, and we will be running a third webinar in, in the fall timeframe. So just to, to start off, I'd just like to share some housekeeping with you all. Um, first of all, today's session will be recorded and will be made available to you post event uh, with links sent to you via email and your registration details to both the recording itself and a PDF of the slides that we're presenting today. And then lastly, um, if you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them in the Q&A tab. Now that can be found in the bottom of your middle bottom of your screens. Uh, we will be keeping an eye on that instead of the chat so much. The reason being for that is that we, if we do not have enough time to answer all of your questions uh, in that Q&A tab, we will be recording it and we'll be responding to you post event if we don't have a chance to answer it in the Q&A which will follow at the end of all of the panelist sessions today. So moving to the next slide, um, I'm lucky to be joined uh, by a group of people that are representing both leading lights in the service provider community, as well as the vendor community. Uh, my name is Craig Thomas, by the way, I'm the Vice President of Strategic Marketing and be moderating today's session. Uh, but as I said, uh, the panelists today uh, representing both from a vendor perspective, uh, Juniper and Ericsson, and then from the service provider community, Telstra, Deutsche Telekom, and Verizon. Now, one thing that all of these uh, esteemed panelists have in common is their work within standards bodies, and especially the broadband forum. And each one of them are instrumental in contributing to our standards work. So first and foremost, on behalf of the broadband forum, I'd like to thank them. And, uh, and then we'll move along quite nicely onto the agenda for today's uh, webinar. Um, today's webinar, as I said, is focused very much on the 5G res residential gateway. We'll be first looking at the scope of the and the 5G system enablers. Uh, we'll then be looking at a, a functional view of the 5G RG environment. Uh, and included in that will be some use cases. Uh, we'll then be looking at the whole end-to-end uh, -end multi access um, enablers that we are looking for inside the 5G RG and looking to some more use cases in regards to shared access. And then finally, what does the 5G in a services based gateway look like from a service provider's needs and requirements perspective? And as I said, um, finally, at the end of all of that, we will be running a Q&A session. So not trying to hold up anything more, I'd like to now pass on to uh, Greg Dahl of Juniper, who's uh, going to go into the scope of the 5G system enablers. Greg, over to you. Thanks, Greg, and uh, happy 5G de Mayo, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Dahl. I'm a Director of Product Management in uh, Juniper for 5G Solutions, and I'm also uh, co-lead of the project stream for uh, 5G in uh, Broadband Forum. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So we are building up on top of the uh, webinar we had uh, in, uh, in March, um, and we're going to uh, paste in the chat the link to this uh, webinar. If you missed it, I encourage you to go to it uh, and look at uh, some of the basics uh, related to 5G wireless wireline convergence, including uh, the why uh, we're doing this, uh, what are the benefits, the use cases, the architecture aspects, uh, and including also how to deploy and migrate from the existing to the new architecture 
as well as all the uh, the standardization efforts that have been shared between 3GPP and the, the broadband forum. Uh, you'll find also some testimonies from uh, two leading operators, Telstra and uh, Tim. Uh, and if you're like me, a uh, vendor, and uh, you certainly want to build things that will get uh, relevant for the market space, so having operators weigh in and, and give their a point of view for this is very critical. And uh, today we're going to do the same with uh, actually three lead operators. So uh, again, uh, feel free to, uh, to go to this uh, past webinar if you missed it. Next slide, please. All right, so today we're going to drill a little bit deeper into uh, use cases and uh, focusing on aspects that are actually unique to uh, wireless wireline convergence and in particular on how this can enable new services for devices in the home. Uh, so again, focusing on things really unique to wireless wireline convergence. The star of this presentation today is actually going to be the 5G residential gateway. So you might remember from the past webinar, we can spot both legacy residential gateways that we call fixed network residential gateways, as well as residential gateways that are augmented with 5G functionalities. So everything we're going to cover today is based on those advanced functionalities that are tailored for 5G inside the residential gateway. Next. So this uh, comes from the, uh, uh, the past webinar. Uh, and on the left side, you find this uh, residential gateways, uh, the new ones, as well as the legacy ones. Uh, and on the right side, the network aspect. So the blue part is the 5G core network that's uh, defined by 3GPP. You find the control plane aspects as well as the user plane. And the 5G access gateway function is really the mediation function between the wireline access network and the 5G core. So it has uh, a user plane interfaces uh, N3, which is GTPU uh, towards the 5G core, as well as signaling and control plane interfaces, so N1 and uh, N2 interface towards the uh, AMF. And uh, for your convenience, uh, we put a couple of uh, acronyms here so that you're not completely lost. Uh, and uh, you have different deployment scenarios. Uh, you can have just wireline access, or you can have just uh, wireless access for the fixed wireless access use case on top. And then you have the hybrid use case where a uh, residential gateway can have two types of access, fixed uh, wireline and, and uh, fixed wireless. And so we'll talk about that today. We mentioned that the access gateway function uh, can, be, um, uh, can be separated into control plane and user plane. So that's the CUPS model. And uh, also um, optional is the co-location of the UPF with the AGF. So basically the entry interface you see here becomes internal uh, to the uh, combined AGF, UPF. And so that can be valuable in terms of uh, optimizing the uh, data plane so that you have only one data plane combining AGF and, and UPF. So if we move to the next slide, I'd like to focus on uh, enablers, on four actually key enablers. The first one is multi-session. And again, keep in mind, this is only available for the 5G residential gateway. The idea here is to be able to multiplex, multiplex up to 16 sessions on top of uh, the customer VLAN or the ethernet interface going to re the residential gateway on the left here. So, this enables uh, actually each session to be uh, unique in terms of UPF selection. So uh, each session can have separate user plane uh, functions, uh, unique addressing per session, different QoS and policies, as well as different owners in terms of charging and billing. So some examples here that we got from our service providers is being able to separate voice. So for example, you can manage a voice session on a dedicated user plane function that is virtualized, uh, that has uh, private IP addressing, while the internet traffic might be uh, handled by the combined or the collocated UPF with the, with the AGF. 
you could have also the video traffic uh, on its own session. You could have Wi-Fi, like community Wi-Fi separated and sent to its own UPF. Uh, you could have business traffic, and that's actually an example we're going to have in a few minutes when Dave takes, takes it from me. So a lot of different use cases and um, by having separate PDU sessions end to end. And it's enabled by having the capacity to multiplex sessions so having separate data planes between the AGF and the 5GRG. Next slide. The second key enabler is multi-access um, and with a, a functionality called ATSSS, like steering, switching, and splitting, or ATS3. And that's based on having the RG with dual access, uh, PON, DSL on the wireline side, L, uh, 5G, but also LTE uh, on the uh, wireless side. And the LTE support is actually critical because you don't need to wait to have 5G deployed everywhere, 5G radio deployed everywhere. You can implement it with the existing uh, radio and you can create one logical connection, which is called a multi-access PDU session above this uh, dual access. And it's managed as one logical session. It can combine in particular the bandwidth across uh, dual access. And the benefit of having this virtual or logical session over dual access is obviously more reliability. Uh, if one link goes down, there is a seamless availability of connectivity, bandwidth aggregation, and also policy-based forwarding, right? So you can actually decide dynamically based on PS PCF or policy and charging function instructions, how the traffic uh, selects one leg over the other one. So you could say, for example, Voice is a low uh, bandwidth application. I might want to use the bandwidth available on wireless while uh, my IPTV service goes on top of the, uh, uh, the wireline access. It's a similar in to some extent uh, with what you can find in, uh, in SD1, right? But this is really a service that's available and delivered by the operator. It's not an over the top uh, service. So Manuel will actually cover this, uh, uh, this mechanism. Uh, this is in general transparent to the AGF. Uh, as you can see, this ATS3 functionality is implemented both in the 5G core in the resident and in the residential gateway. Uh, obviously, if the UPF is co-located with the AGF, then there is indirectly an impact on the AGF. Next slide. The third enabler we are covering here is uh, network exposure. And really the idea here is to give a chance to third party applications to interact with the, the 5G network. So the application function that's um, owned by uh, potentially another operator or even the same operator or vert vertical service provider, think about uh, an IoT operator uh, or an enterprise or uh, uh, cloud service providers, hyperscalers, can interact with the network through an API. Uh, the API talks to a 5G core control plane function, which is called a network exposure function. The role of this uh, function is actually to uh, uh, protect and abstract the 5G core network. Uh, and through this API, the external application can subscribe to events, so it can know if uh, specific subscribers or devices are coming up online. Uh, it can know if there is some mobility events, which obviously in the case of uh, uh, fixed is not really relevant. Uh, it can know about bandwidth information, so it can run query to have network and subscriber information or context so that it can adapt to uh, the network specifics and maybe change codecs uh, or, or you know, select different uh, edge uh, function to deliver the service to the end user. Uh, so it can, it can even influence the way that the network is behaving uh, in terms of selecting a specific UPF or in terms of uh, uh, applying differentiated quality of service and policies. And so it's really like, uh, think about the network as a service where uh, this, uh, this API can be consumed by 
the external entity. And so by having wireline integrate with the 5G core, we can get the benefits of this network exposure uh, also apply to wireline access. So the use cases we can think uh, of is uh, things like uh, IoT, I mentioned, Edge Cloud uh, apply to uh, wireline functionalities, sponsored access, you could have a third party actually fund some of the bandwidth uh, of, uh, uh, of a subscriber. And so it uh, enables a sort of a dual side uh, model for service providers where they can not only provide value to, the, to their, their own subscribers, but also to third party who themselves are interacting with the end user. And by basically improving the end user experience for their own applications. And so we'll put this network exposure in context with the uh, uh, sample use case that David, uh, Dave, sorry, will cover in a few minutes. Same, um, uh, please, next slide. So the last enabler I'd like to cover is uh, the home traffic mapping. So we talked about multi-session uh, being applied to wireline. Now the value here obviously is to extend that inside the home and being able to map the devices and the end users that are in the home with the, the multiple sessions that we have upstream of the, five, uh, the 5G residential gateway. And so here it's actually something that uh, we already have the basis of this available in the residential gateways today. So being able to map some of the specific devices, uh, including based on their MAC address based on uh, the LAN or the wireless line uh, SSID that they are connected to onto an upstream link or logical link. So we're going to be able to uh, reuse that. And as you know, the number of devices in the, in the home is growing very fast, um, you know. And uh, so being able to map, for example, IoT devices here, I put, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, um, solar panels uh, that can be managed remotely and, and mapped to an IoT session uh, or the voice or the video or specific uh, home office uh, assets to be mapped to their own VPN. Uh, that's something that's actually um, uh, supported by the 5G residential gateway. And we can manage that dynamically through TR69 or TR369, which is USP. And we have data models to do that. So part of the work that uh, Broadband Forum is doing is to uh, generate the data models to enable this uh, dynamic mapping of uh, the devices in the home and the upstream 5G session or PDUs on the, on the call side. So all these um, enablers, actually, we're going to put them in, uh, in context uh, through use case um, uh, deep dives. But before we do that, I talked about the 5G residential gateway. I'd like to pass it on to David Woolley uh, so that he can give uh, actually a snapshot of what functionally this 5G residential gateway looks like. David, take it on. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'd like to start off with a little bit of RG theory for those people that aren't familiar with what's under the hood. Uh, now, what I've got on this particular slide is uh, what we call an FNRG, uh, Fixed Network Residential Gateway. So there's some common properties. Uh, the first is it's uh, a software and a chip-based hardware. Uh, you know, typically, we use Linux, although OpenBSD is a contender as well. Chipset vendors tend to provide a little bit of software in the form of drivers. And then there's a services framework that goes over the top. Now that could be a software development kit from the vendor. It could be open source like OpenWRT or Purple. RDKB is another option or something proprietary uh, from the vendor itself. Now in the diagram uh, at the top right, uh, this is an example of how Purple uh, lay out their stack, but they all have a similar uh, layering approach uh, to what I've got there. Uh, and there's some common functionality that, it, that, a, fun, uh, that a FNRG will have. Um, there's always going to be physical layers, networking, IP management, quality of service, DNS, 
device management and, and user interface as the core common functionality. Uh, there are, of course, um, uh, more advanced features, but, but that's the, the basic set um, that they all will have. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we turn our attention to uh, a 5G RG, we have all of those capabilities plus more. Now, in Greg's previous slide, you talked about CUPS, Control User Plane Separation. It's just as home in a 5G RG as it is uh, in our 5G core. Uh, so you can see there's a couple of things that um, have direct equivalence. Um, so you know, we've got our user plane, which you know, really you know, maps into uh, the UPS. And then in our control plane, you know, we've got uh, that maps into um, the AMF as much as anything, particularly the access management box. So let's have a look at uh, what that brings us. So I mentioned access management, that's one of the first of the three major capabilities. So the first thing we've got to take into consideration is it's multiple access technology by design. Yes, we have hybrid gateways uh, now. However, um, they tend to be rather statically configured and um, will manually move from one access technology to the other. With a 5G RG, it will seamlessly uh, move a session from one access technology to another. That's by design. Uh, the next really, really crucial thing is uh, our persistent uh, management channel. With an FNRG, you get one opportunity to control the circumstances under which an FNRG operates. That's the authorization phase of authentication. And after that, it's all over. Um, the session stays up and you can't change anything as a service provider until re-authentication. With a 5G RG, that channel is up all the time and you can initiate whatever changes you need when you need to. It's an incredibly powerful um, yeah, uh, benefit. Uh, we're moving to uh, SIM-based authentication. And lastly, for those that have been down the IPOE path, we've brought back the liveliness test. One of the big issues with IPOE, of course, is that you don't know that a session's gone down until a lease expires. And there's any number of techniques that have been used to get around that problem. We've gone back to basics and uh, uh, we'll know within uh, seconds that there's an issue. Uh, ATSSS, which was mentioned before by Greg, takes that to a new level, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, the next major function box is session management. This is where we bring up our PDU sessions. Somewhat analogous to an IP session. However, a PDU, can be a raw ethernet frame. It doesn't have to be uh, an IP session. That's an incredibly powerful thing because prior to now, if you've wanted to support uh, raw ethernet frames as a product for say um, enterprise customers, you've had to put uh, a tunnel over the top of an IP session. And that is a terribly inefficient way of carrying traffic. So that's native. Uh, other things, you can have multiple sessions. You're not just restricted to one. Um, so as Greg mentioned before, uh, I think it's up to 16. And, uh, and can be any combination of uh, you know, IP or raw ethernet frames. And we can bring them up and down any time we want to uh, after we've um, authenticated onto the network. Uh, lastly, A2SSS. Uh, we did uh, describe it as uh, access technology, steering, splitting, and switching. One of the things that wasn't mentioned before is it has performance monitoring built in automatically. So you can initiate a change between access technology as soon as performance drops below a, um, a pre-configured uh, minimum. So again, moving towards uh, that goal of a seamless user experience. Uh, and lastly, quality of service. Quality of service does change considerably. It focuses more on prioritization and shaping uh, than it does on raw packet marking. 
uh, probably the most fundamental thing is that the markings that we apply to a packet do not indicate the priority of a packet as it transits through the network. It's merely a label, um, which, which points to a 5QI. The 5QI itself um, is either um, a standard value as defined by 3GPP, or it can actually be custom for an individual service provider. It's the 5QI that contains uh, the prioritization. Um, so it's a different way of looking at things but uh, it's probably a, a, a more positive change to how we've been looking at quality of service uh, in the past. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? So how are we going to build a 5G RG? Well, the first step that we'd like to uh, go through is some reference software. Now, we acknowledge that we're going to need to prime the pump somewhat. Um, especially with the open source community. So uh, we're going to initiate a project whereby we, we come up with an implementation of the control plane for a 5G RG. We want to be able to negotiate um, access. We want to be able to create uh, PDU sessions. Why do we need this? Well, uh, we need that to validate the development of the AGF. So at the moment, um, there's a lot of AGF development going on. They're being tested with FNRGs and only unit tested when it comes to uh, the 5G control techniques. Uh, the next thing that we want to have a look at is how we register. We want to turn our attention to SIM management because that's got cryptographic challenges, uh, which again is a new technique. So we need to get on top of that. And lastly, you know, we need uh, the control mechanisms for bringing up PDUs. So we want to have a stab at, um, at that software. And then once we've got that going, we want to get that uh, into our open source partners as quickly as possible. So we're looking at OpenWRT, Purple. Uh, there are others out there as well. And also last but not least, the chipset manufacturers, because there's an acknowledgement that it's their software development kits that are going in as the core of the retail gateways, the ones that you would buy uh, at an electronics store, as opposed to the ones that are manufactured directly for a service provider. So we believe that the first five GRGs will be um, those ordered by uh, the service providers. But we'd like um, the, the rest of the market to catch up as well with the 5G initiative. And lastly, um, RG vendors out there, we really want to hear from you. We want to work directly uh, to bring the 5G RG to fruition. Next slide, please. Now, I'd also like to uh, present some, uh, one use case before uh, my colleagues uh, cover off on the rest. So this is all about security. So typically a service provider needs to manage um, our, our residential gateways. But on top of that, it also needs our remote access for the purposes of service assurance. We're going to be uh, collecting some bulk data and more and more we're starting to see uh, performance monitoring agents that could be throughput tests, uh, Wi-Fi performance and so on. The problem is all of these things do in fact open us up to um, you know, vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, we're going to have exposed ports both on the gateway and also for that matter uh, on the servers that are providing those services. So how do we try, how do we get around this? Uh, you know, at the very least, we're open for denial of service. And data theft, well, there's a little bit of reputational damage there. And as for out, out and out control of the device, well, we just don't want to go there. So what would the solution for that look like? Next slide, please. So in this proposal, we're going to have multiple PDU sessions. So we have our standard PDU session, which is for general um, internet access, and we're going to have a PDU session for our secure zone. So by having a separate dedicated PDU session, 
uh, we can avoid the internet entirely. In the diagram, you can see that uh, you've got a dedicated UPF, it goes just to the secure zone, and you can organize it as a service provider such that that network never has access to the internet at all. So straight away, uh, we've eliminated um, ports being visible to um, you know, external users. Uh, we can then choose to uh, control what IP ranges we allocate to uh, PDU. Each PDU is completely separate routable IP addresses. Um, you may even choose to use private IP space if that uh, meets uh, your particular needs. In fact, uh, if you're using IPv4, you're definitely going to want to do that since you don't have addresses to spare. Um, if we do need to um, allow um, third party providers access to the secure zone, as a service provider, you're controlling what traffic enters the zone. So again, uh, the, the opportunity for abuse is vastly reduced. And last but not least, um, we can apply some rate limiting to a PDU session, which means that its impact on the customer is going to be lessened. And that's another important part of security as well. You don't want to have one function um, you know, detracting from uh, the use of the others. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Manuel uh, for the multi-access use cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And hello, everybody. Manuel Paul with Deutsche Telekom and a member of the board of Broadband Forum, vice president and 5G project stream lead. I do have the pleasure to uh, drill deeper into the multi-access family of use cases. So next slide, please. And I would like to start with a brief overview of um, what we actually think and see from the perspective of multi-access, what is enabled. We did hear about the tech technical background and um, great introduction from Greg already. So during this, um, you have seen that the 5G core network is a great enabler in terms of the capabilities to run sessions and even uh, multiple sessions, but also single multi-access sessions across accesses. And so if you consider now that at Broadband Forum, we have specifications in place that um, support hybrid access, and um, you know that those um, specifications and the technology allows to maximize throughput, redundancy and reliability, you would actually like to understand, so what is new with 5G and with our capabilities that are specified and being specified for the 5G RG. So actually for the area of hybrid access, now we have the opportunity here, as said, to not just run isolated sessions on each axis, which then can be combined, steered, switched, or splitted. Now it is also possible to have sessions that are multi-axis, single sessions. And with that, we have a lot of advances that uh, come through this multi-path capability, tying into the SwitchBP R16 work that allow to bring more fine-grained traffic steering, switching and splitting across accesses, and an improved QS and session management. Now, uh, also considering that fixed wireless access is a key scenario and use case to be supported, we can actually move and uh, progress from a sort of cabled access replacement or alternative to a new level where the devices connected to the 5G RG, as well as um, the 5G RG itself, can benefit from an integrated, more integrated, seamless service delivery, and also device management, rather than having to care about separate 
and uh, isolated networks of its own. So looking at both areas, fixed wireless access, as well as multi-access, including hybrid access, we see that the toolkit that is specified by SwitchBP and BBF allows a more seamless service experience for customers across any available network asset. And the common backend, which is a 5G core network and its functions allow to use and reuse consistently service session and policy management capabilities, as well as the set improved QoS and charging functionalities. Moreover, of course, also, this is not a steady state. There is um, continued innovation going into uh, the technology at BBF, but also at 3GBP. So future advances that are already uh, charted out with um, ATSSS as um, introduced by Greg um, would be <clears throat> the um, non-TCP based traffic support with ATSSS as well as an improvement on the capable devices that are operated behind a 5G RG um, yeah, gateway that is ATSSS capable. So here we see that we have a smooth evolution path to a standardized 5G hybrid, allowing to migrate smoothly from existing solutions and bring the benefits of the 5G core network and toolkit. Next slide, please. So now uh, looking a little bit um, more into this toolkit and what it brings in context of hybrid and multi-access. So as said, services that are deployed across multiple accesses can benefit from a consistent feature set and consistent operation. And the QoS management capabilities per session are advanced and can be leveraged across different accesses. That brings the benefit that for the customer that is interested in consuming application with the appropriate QoS, no matter the access network, or if um, dependent on an actual certain um, performance, access specific, the traffic can be steered and the access network can be selected, still maintaining common identity and a common session or single session for an application. And we have already heard that multi-session capabilities are built in, which also allows a per application delivery of uh, services. So all in all, the 5G toolkit and the enablement of multi-access capabilities enables beyond the existing use cases improvements and opens up uh, great uh, improvements for the new use cases and areas like gaming or VPN. And while we are going to hear more about that from Dave in a moment, let me just um, show some examples on the next slide to give the full picture of um, key use cases and areas enabled by multi-access with ATSSS and the 5G residential gateway. So as said, we do leverage and see uh, from an operator perspective already the benefits of um, a network assisted more fine granular policy and um, session steering that can be extended across any access. It enables us also then to address beyond the existing use cases, new use cases that require a better reliability. I think uh, all of us are right now really heavily leveraging and banking on broadband connections for our home office. And um, so really work productivity 
in addition to that in future, there are also opportunities to provide um, selection of lowest latency paths, for example, leveraging ATSSS and the 5G RG to provide a better gaming experience as an example, or as said, future applications that uh, are being identified. Altogether, having this toolkit specified by Broadband Forum and 3GPP brings um, standard products and um, those products leveraging open source software and um, in compliance to the specifications of BBF and SwitchPP, bring a best, uh, best breed of solutions and offer the opportunity for lower TCO overall, and um, in particular also for so solutions leveraging multi-access. So with that, I would like to um, go to the next slide and hand it over to Dave Allen. Thank you, Manuel. Yeah, okay, so I'm Dave Allen, uh, basically a relic in this industry at this point, uh, but I, uh, my role is fairly germane to this presentation, being the WWC area director and a distinguished engineer at Ericsson. Um, and I wanna talk about shared access use cases. Next slide, please. So we have a number of use cases where the ability to separate traffic into separate sessions or flows and then have a unique business relationship per session or flow is of interest to the 5G operators. Now this can be achieved in a number of ways depending on the requirements of the parties involved. The key thing is the 5G system can dynamically establish this separation of interest scenarios to accommodate the needs of the various actors connected to the 5G system. Um, this probably sounds a little bit confusing, but we'll dig into the enablers and a representative use case to illustrate exactly what we mean. And some example use cases that leverage this would be uh, distance learning, where enhanced QoS may be required to support collaboration tools, Parental controls, where the children's access is logically separated in the home and directed to cloud-based monitoring and access control systems. Public Wi-Fi, where the subscribers also provide a public hotspot, which for obvious reasons needs to be isolated from the home network. And enhanced work from home, um, which we'll drill into as a bit of a poster child for this approach. Next chart. So as a quick bit of a recap, the, the enablers or basic building blocks we're talking about here is first, we're looking at traffic separation in the, pro, in the premises. This can range from flow steering with applied QOS to actual physical or logical network separation using ports, SSIDs, or VLANs. The next is mapping these traffic partitions at the 5G RG to one or more sessions, which you can interpret as VPNs in the WAN. Distinct sessions can be coupled with traffic isolation to create separated perimeters in the home and address different traffic steering requirements. And the key thing here is that this is supported by TR69 and 369 as extended for 5G. And it's what this enables is that the 5G RG's capabilities can be integrated with the 5G system and the 5G system's capabilities can be consumed by the RG. I, I can't state the importance of this enough. We have the ability to do third party control of QOS and charging for enhanced services from flows to sessions. And this is achieved with the 5G network exposure function which enables a number of 3GPP charging paradigms to divide access costs across multiple parties. And we have exposure of content context and security related information to authorized third parties. Uh, and this is the, again, the 5G network exposure function, which allows additional context information to be shared with network based authentication systems such as zero trust network access and SASE. 
to enhance security capabilities by advertising things like the, the location of the employee, the provenance of the equipment, et cetera. Next chart. So as I mentioned, I wanted to dig a bit deeper into the enhanced work from home use case. One of the consequences of the pandemic we've been living with has been incre an increased trend to work from home. The circumstances of the pandemic pretty much required it as much as possible, drove innovation in the tooling that supported it, and saw the deployment of corporate assets to facilitate it. So the ability to enhance the work from home environment is moving to the forefront. These includes aspects such as a better quality of experience, resilient connectivity, and increased alignment with the best practices for enterprise security and IT, such as zero trust, context-driven multi-factor authentication, SASE, et cetera. The key thing here is that the workstation in the home requires differentiated handling in a number of dimensions, separate from the other internet appliances in the home. And this brings forward new business requirements and opportunities for the enterprise and the 5G operator. Next chart. So to illustrate this opportunity, here's a practical example. We have Jane frequently works from home she has an existing internet service that's used by both her and her family. Now, Jane's a bit of a power user and a valued knowledge worker, so her employer wants to make sure her connectivity is suitable for the demanding applications and collaboration tools, that the connectivity is always there, and her employer is willing to pay for the enhanced connectivity, but does want it separated from Jane's existing service. And Jane wants to, her employer wants to make sure that all of her workstation traffic goes through the corporate network without exposure to the internet. There, additional security policies can be applied. These days, this would typically be a cloud pop with a lot of virtualized security infrastructure to protect corporate assets. And at the same time, neither her nor her employer want the enterprise network to see the traffic from Jane's other internet appliances. Next chart, please. So a combination of features of the 5G RG and the 5G system combine to make this possible. The 5G control plane provides real-time fulfillment of changes to Jane's connectivity and costs. Multi-session capability of the 5G RG is used to extend VPN access and differentiate, differentiated handling to traffic to Jane's home. TR69 managed traffic separation in the home isolates her workstation from her other home information appliances and directs it to the enterprise VPN. This can be via a physical port, SSID or VLANs in the home. ATSSS based hybrid access adds reliability and the possibility of an on-demand bandwidth boost. And this could be uniquely applied to Jane's corporate access. And the 5G network exposure function allows the enterprise to control the costs of Jane's work-related traffic to switch charging for all her work-related traffic from Jane to the enterprise and to extract useful security information from the 5G system, such as the location of access. Next chart. So we, we need the ability to set this up. The main challenges are those introduced as a result of this being a three-way relationship, Jane, her employer, and her communication service provider. So Jane provides subscription information to her employer and authorizes the employer to have her provided, her provider add the enterprise VPN to her allowable session list and a separate SSID to her 5G RG. Jane's employer coordinates with the provider who updates Jane's subscription privileges and configuration accordingly via the combination of 5G and broadband forum automation. This flows through to the premises. Jane is provided with credentials for the enterprise SSID in her home. Her, her 5G RG connects her workstation to the new SSID and couples that to the enterprise VPN. And there, any additional authentication can be provided by the enterprise itself. 
And Jane's employer uses the 5G network exposure function to take things from there once the basics are in place. This could include requiring multi-factor authentication, modifying quality of service, redirecting charging, all according to enterprise policies. Next chart. So this ends up being a win-win all the way around. Jane gets a superior work environment and she's not subsidizing her employer's IT budget to get it. The 5G operator has service offerings to increase the stickiness of the broadband access, the ability to offer more stringent SLAs and, and, and tools to monetize this. And the enterprise can provide employees with a superior work from home environment, enhance their security, and only pay for the parts of the overall service to the home that the enterprise itself consumes as part of its business. So next chart. And I'll turn it over to Mike. Yeah, hey, thank you very much, Dave. Um, if we could please move into the next slide. I, I think uh, you're going to start to, as you probably already have heard some synergy between all of the presenters today, all of the distinguished presenters. Uh, you know, obviously, when we look at the complexity of the home or the complexity of the, the business, um, the number of devices is increasing dramatically. The types of services that are running on those devices is also exponentially increasing. Uh, video content, uh, whether that's coming over legacy means or uh, streaming could be provided by the provider or could be provided by a third party. Uh, wearables are being seen at increased uh, numbers, um, home access, you know, the, the common home access that we look at today for the, the subscriber, um, that seems to stay, stay consistent. We want to make sure that that service uh, is not impacted and the quality of experience is not impacted. Uh, we see IoT devices coming into the arena, uh, as well as the opportunity um, for XR applications and or increased uh, opportunities with gaming devices. Um, these devices are, you know, interfaced over uh, copper or Wi-Fi technologies. Uh, we do see the introduction of, uh, you know, the six gigahertz Wi-Fi uh, over a number of regions. And then, you know, obviously when we look at a 5G WAN interface in the residential gateway, um, there is an opportunity to leverage of the 5G network and its service qualification to um, allow for the mapping of these services into um, our network. Now, and I do want to be clear, you know, as our service providers are using more than just 5G, they could have a hybrid approach where they have wireless and wireline connectivity to that residential gateway. Um, that residential gate may, may just be 5G with, with 4G as, uh, as backup or we could have wireline applications. And so moving forward, you know, I believe it's our objective to have a consistent model so that the services as defined in the premise are available and uh, opportunistically mapped uh, to the existing uh, quality of service mechanisms, not only in the, in the 5G domain, um, but also in the wireline domain. If we can move forward to the next slide, please. When we look at these services, you know, obviously we have things uh, from a business perspective like software defined WAN, uh, VPN services, and those VPN services may be outbound VPN services uh, connecting to uh, a, a specific uh, a connection point, uh, an employer, um, but also those could be inbound VPN, VPN services uh, for small, medium business type of uh, subscribers that have a workforce that, you know, and I guess to, to Dave and Dave and, and Manuel and, and Greg and everyone's point, uh, working from home or, or learning from home. Uh, we have, uh, you know, management capabilities uh, and that remote management being either CWMP based or, or USP based or something else if you're in a uh, RDK type of environment. Um, but we, see, we start to see that the grouping of these services 
uh, which then could obviously be mapped into the grouping of quality of service uh, from the network. Uh, we do see a lot of overlap in these services, advanced security, parental controls, you know, parental controls probably doesn't apply in a, in a, in a business domain, um, but, but the concept is, is very similar where we would want to understand what's happening with the network. Um, working and learning from home and VPN services, there's a, a very a, a large amount of consistency in that comment um, because on both sides, you know, this would potentially be viable whether you're a consumer or a business customer. Um, IoT devices, uh, health and wellness, you know, largely on the consumer side. Uh, video streaming is, is, is not just a consumer application, it's a business application as, as we look at uh, educational services and other types of business services. So, so when we look at all these services that are, you know, being instantiated for a business and consumer customer, how do we manage them more effectively? And you've heard, you know, a number of comments, you know, from our distinguished uh, panelists about the mapping of these services into the 5G network. Um, but as we move forward, you know, really the mechanisms in place, uh, probably there's some opportunity for some augmentation. If we can move to the next slide, please. Looking specifically, and I'll, I'm gonna focus on the purple framework here, um, the, the inclusion of the ability to drop in services uh, into the, the residential gateway for uh, customer facing applications, as we mentioned in the, in the prior slide, um, the ability to drop in uh, both operational service or business support service uh, type applications, um, the inclusion of what we would call an, an application classifier. So, so how does the, the, the RG really understand how we're going to map these services that are growing inside the home or the business um, to the service providers network and the ability to take those services um, as defined and map them into network optimization or what we will call a SON inside the home um, so that the quality of experience that's defined in the network is carried through all the way down to the station or endpoint uh, for the, the customer. Um, the ability to leverage a, a data model and have that data model start to be dynamic in nature as we start to add these services into uh, the subscriber domain, um, you know, obviously a, a need for lifecycle management of those devices. And when we look at the opportunity to take these services and then map them specifically to not only the network, but for full end-to-end -end quality of experience, um, the importance is gonna be very clear. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. So, so, so how do we do this, our, our path forward? And, and we've talked about you know, some of the standards from 3GPP, uh, Purple, RDKB, if we're going to fully look at end-to-end -end quality of experience, then you know, being able to articulate those services in the Wi-Fi domain is gonna be important so that we are able to gain that end-to-end -end quality of experience. And then you know, all of us are from the broadband forum driving a clear message uh, of coordination, not only between the service provider, uh, but vendors, but these other standards organizations. Uh, when we look at the ability to then implement network slicing, uh, it's gonna be extremely important that we're able to articulate the service from the network side down to the services uh, from the premise perspective. Um, the existing uh, network Wi-Fi management and land management services will evolve as we see the network uh, systems evolve moving forward. And uh, I think that concludes my presentation. Uh, I think we're going to now open it up for questions and answers. Next slide, please. Next, I'm going to handle it over to uh, Craig Thomas for some wrap up and then potentially into Q&A. Thank you very much. No, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mike. And thank you, all the panelists. Uh, great sessions today. Um, and we've generated a lot of good questions as well. And I'd just like to thank the panelists for answering a lot of those uh, whilst uh, the session was going on. Uh, but as always the nature of that, maybe uh, they've answered the questions that they like to have uh, and left the questions that they don't want to have. So I'm going to ask them hopefully 
questions that aren't too difficult for them anyway. Um, the first one here is um, one of the most popular people we've been talking about today was Jane. Uh, and in her use case, uh, the question is, what kind of CPE requirements does she need? Um, David, it was your use case. Uh, maybe you would like to answer. Well, in essence, it's going to be a 5TRG. Um, at its simplest form, say without ATSSS, and it's just fixed wireless access, it would have the radio module, uh, the 5G control plane, uh, and the rest of the RG would be pretty much as Dave Woolley described, um, with some Linux, possibly a little bit of hardware assist. Um, but the key thing is, is that we can manipulate the steering and that with TR69. So we're not talking a huge leap there, but we are talking quite a spectrum of devices ranging from ones that host virtualization environments, ranging down to about as close to a hockey puck as we can get. Uh, so, but that's the, that's the key piece we're working on right now uh, is getting that specified and done and dusted so the industry can move on. And I would observe that with fixed wireless access, we're already well down that path of you know, driving that to a commoditization level. Uh, thank you, David. Um, so uh, another question here, and it's quite forward thinking, and it's in line of uh, two or three others actually that we've had uh, in regards to uh, when could the 5G hybrid access, the ATSS or AGF, solution be available also for non-TCP traffic, as in in production or any estimations out there? Anyone like to answer that one at all? Manuel, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, let me take a shot at this. So uh, I think this uh, is also subject to our friends from 3GBP uh, working on release 18, where I believe um, this is being studied right now and will be planned to be made available. So once that is done, um, we at BBF um, and the 5GIG can leverage the standards um, as they are supported with the 5G core. And that would make the multipath capability for non-TCP traffic available to the 5GRG. Great. I believe there's an effort at the moment to get uh, Quick involved. Now, um, Quick is uh, UDP based. So yes, there, there is uh, an intent to try and make that work for UDP. Thank you, David, as well. Great. Um, here's one. Um, maybe we could clarify the value proposition to the consumer, uh, particularly, um, sorry, my, uh, my so many questions coming in at the same time. Here we go. Particularly uh, the address consumer resistance to any kind of usage-based charging. Why would a consumer select a fixed service provider offering FMC over one that provides legacy broadband? David Allen? Um, well, it's actually more likely the provider would enable it. The key thing here is, for example, the what the consumer is doing is, is they're opening their access up such that somebody else can pay for the enhanced services, uh, whereas their internet access service would probably all be zero rated. Um, I think that's probably the key thing is, then they also may choose to, do, the, the provider may choose to use network separation techniques, for example, for parental controls, uh, not necessarily based on usage charging. I mean, usage is not the only paradigm we're talking about here. So what it is, is it opens up the business, the potential business relationships connected with the access as well as offering new services, both to the consumer themselves uh, and to those the consumer has, the, has various relationships with. So mm -hmm. I think that's that it's not just a blanket application of usage charging uh, and, and something that, yeah, I would agree would naturally have consumer resistance. It's, it's that complete opening up of relationships. No, great. Um, Greg, maybe one for you here. Uh, would the existing fixed network RG uh, be software upgradable to 5G RG functionality? 
Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I would say in, in theory, yes. Um, and we are aware that some RG vendors are planning to do so, uh, which, you know, would be beneficial because the, the refresh cycles on the RGs are, you know, not as fast as changing a smartphone, right? Uh, typically, I, I believe the average lifespan of an RG might be as long as uh, five to seven years. So yeah, it's a, it is a possibility. Uh, there are some RGs out there that have LTE support, uh, but typically they are used only as a backup or uh, independently of what's going on on the wireline side. And uh, those also would be good candidates to uh, you know to evolve to 5G RG. So yes, it is a possibility. Great. We do have a question in regards to explaining network slicing. Um, we are little bit overrunning. So just to say that there will be sessions at our Bullband Summit next week uh, on network slicing, uh, as well as the recording, I think, of last uh, WWC that we touched on it. And I think it'd be another conversation piece for future webinars. So uh, I apologize that we don't have the time to go into details in regards to network slicing. Uh, but let's have one more question before we finish. Um, here's one, is the AGF a must? Could it be bypassed with another control logic or direct 5G encapsulation originated from the 5G RG? Um, Greg, would you like to have a, a go at that one first? Yeah, so uh, it is a must in, in the case of uh, using wireline, right? Because you, you need to mediate between you know, VLAN and, uh, and uh, PDU sessions the way that the 5G core is, is doing it. So both on the control plane and on the user plane side. Uh, but that being said, the AGF is a, it's a logical function, right? <clears throat> so it means that you could implement it uh, as a software upgrade in an access node, a BNG. You could combine it with the user plane function or the, the 5G core. So it doesn't mean like that needs to be a new box uh, that you put in your network. It, it can be just a, a software functionality. Hi, all. Sorry, I had a, I had a PC who froze on me there, so I do, yeah. do apologize com <laughs> I completely. I was wondering what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was panicking a little bit by wondering if my PC would come back in time or not. But uh, gentlemen, um, all I'd like to say is thank you once again for an excellent session. Uh, really enjoyed today. Uh, from my perspective, if we move to the next slide, um, I think you know what we're doing here is is starting to have a call to action to the whole marketplace that the 5G RG is something that's an extremely hot topic moving forward, and um, from a, a broadband forum and specifically the Wireless Wireline Convergence Group, uh, this is our call out to you, uh, the audience, the industry, to get involved. You know there is a need here for software vendors, uh, open software, uh, open source. Uh, organizations, the service provider community, as well as the, the RG vendors and the chipset vendors themselves, working with us as the standards bodies to get this work uh, to a state that uh, is meeting industry requirements and industry needs and best practice deployment models. So from our perspective, this really is your chance to get involved. Uh, please reach out to the Broadband Forum at info at broadband.forum.org if you would like to get involved in this work, or if you're already members, please do get involved with the WWC work. This is a hot topic that will cover not just WWC, but many of our work areas inside the BBF and working with organizations such as 3GPP. Um, so at, all it is left for me to say is our next event is next week. Uh, please do join us next week. We have our State of Broadband Virtual Summit, absolutely free to, uh, to, to attend a four day summit of two and a half hour sessions. You can see the agenda there. Uh, but in regards to WWC, we will be doing some more updates on our day one. Uh, Dave Allen will be presenting uh, the updates on where we're at with WWC work. And also on day four, we will have a number of service providers and vendors that will be talking about network and service delivery. And specifically in some of those cases, the WWC and wireless wireline conventions. So please do register. The registration details are in the chat. Uh, or if you haven't got that, please just reach out to ourselves 
and we can supply that. It's available on our main website page too. So that's it from this session. Once again, thank you very much to all of our panelists. Uh, appreciate your time and thank you for attending this session. We'll be sending out a uh, details of the recording if you do need it um, in the next 24 hours. Thanks once again and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye all.